Hi, my name is Reese Calvin. I'm a third year data science and economics major at Northeastern University. Uh, thank you to Scott and Olive Saber for allowing me to you know, speak in front of you today, as well as Tyrone Brooks for allowing me to be here. Um, now I'm excited to share with you my research in leveraging ball tracking data in uh, building lineup simulators. So what you're looking at, uh, outside my poor display of HTML skills, is a lineup of Shohei Otani's going up against Dodgers pitcher Shohei Otani. More on that later. In previous conferences, we have seen Connor Turner of the Diamond present an effective way to predict the results of pitcher batter outcomes. His solution was to build matrices with each player's plate appearance outcome uh, distribution according to the count. For example, in 2019, in a 1-0 count, Mike Trout hit a single 11% of the time and struck out 16%. For Cy Young pitcher Justin Verlander, he allowed a single 6% of the time and struck out 32%. To predict the outcome, Connor averaged the two matrices. So in a uh, Justin Verlander versus Mike Trout, he predicted in a 1-0 count, a single 9% of the time and a strikeout 24%. Last year, NYU students Jeff Jin and Chris Chen took this a little bit further. Instead of assuming equal value to the pitcher and batter distribution, they used Breyer score to find the optimal weights when determining the matchup outcome. They found 34% uh, of the outcome is determined by the pitcher, while 66 is determined by the hitter. Markov change is going to be a reoccurring topic today. So I wanted to first give a primer so everyone's on the same page. Essentially, a Markov chain allows us to look at a, a a system at a current place in time and calculate the probability of moving to a new state. In baseball, we define a state as a position of runners on base as well as the number of outs. In state one, you see one zero zero zero, or a runner on first base with zero outs. In state two, it says one two zero zero, or a runner on first and second and zero outs. Every half inning can be summarized in this manner. Do you want to calculate how many runs are scored from state one to state two? We'll add up the the total uh, runners on base as well as the outs and then you add one for the batter and, and from that subtract states two total runners on base as well as the outs so we get one runner on base and zero outs plus one for the batter is two and then state two we have two runners on base and zero outs two minus two is zero so we know that zero runs were scored so let's pretend instead state two says zero two zero zero now we have only one runner on base and zero outs so so moving from state one to state two we know that one run was scored Here's another way to visualize the Markov chain. Um, with a runner on second and one out, a single results in the next state being 1001, 40% of the time, and then 1031, 37% of the time. We know in the first outcome, one run was scored, while in the second, zero runs were scored. In the full Markov chain, we'll see every state with every possible result. So now we talked about how we predict one state to the next. How do we actually predict the result? So here's NL 2023 NL Rookie of the Year, Corbin Carroll. So from this visual, you know, against right-handed pitching. So from this visual, you can see grounded out 19% of the time, homered 5% of the time, and struck out 22% of the time. Now here's Rookie of the Year runner-up, Kodai Senga. He allowed ground outs 22% of the time, home runs 1% of the time, and he struck batters out 29% of the time. So at this point, I removed 25% of the data from the data set, the data set being the 2023 regular season. Those gains were used later in the simulation process, but were not included in anything prior. So I split the remaining 75% into further training and testing sets. I used a testing set for each player outcome distribution. I used a testing set to score the training set for the player distribution and the testing set to score the data. I used a grid search method to test every different batter and pitcher weight to find the most optimal in predicting matchup outcomes. Here's a simplified version of the data. In reality, I use specific hit and out types. But for the sake of readability, let's walk through this example used by Jin and Chen in their presentation. Pretend we multiply the two matrices with X weight for the pitcher and one minus X weight for the hitter. And we get a 33% chance of a hit, 33% chance of a walk, and 33% chance of an out. In the reality, we saw a walk occur. That means that there is 33% wrong for the hit, 33% wrong for the out, and 66% and, uh, wrong for the walk. Um, when you square up those numbers and you sum them up, you get 0.66. I did this for every plate appearance and I took the average. I used whatever way I could find for the pitcher and batter to minimize that error. Also, also I added a regression number of n league average results to add to the hitter and the pitcher. Zero would represent their true distribution 
while well, 50 would mean I added 50 plate appearances of the hitter or pitcher getting league average results. So here's what it looks like. Um, oh, so sorry. So this is the outcome. Yeah, 43% weight for the pitcher and 57% weight for the hitter produced the best results. I mentioned at the start of my presentation that Jin Chen got a weight of 34%. I was able to replicate this results, but when I added in pitcher and batter splits, the weight shifted to the aforementioned 43%. I also saw the best results when I added zero regression for the batter and the pitcher. So here's what it looks like with a matchup between Kodai Senga and Corbin Carroll using 43% weight for the pitcher and 57% weight for the batter. So let's do a quick recap. We talked about using Markov change to move from one state to the next, and we talked about using Briar score to find the best combination of hitter and pitcher stats to predict the outcome. Now, how do we use this to simulate and predict an MLB game? So I created the Markov chain and the player distribution stats based on the 75% subset of the data. I then took the 25% of the data, 600 games, and simulated, simulated each game 1,500 times, utilizing a Monte Carlo approach. Starting pitcher was replaced once they allowed five runs or pitched seven innings. Five runs were chosen as a cap because when a, when a pitcher allows five runs early, they're typically removed that inning. A starter who allows four runs typically stays in until at least the next inning. Also, when a pitcher allows fewer than five runs, they typically pitch between five and seven innings. I opted to go with the more extreme seven innings due to how reliever distributions were calculated, as I had more confidence in the reliability of starting pitchers. The way I did relievers was I calculated each team's average distribution for the reliever. Remember how I did Kodai Senga? Well, now imagine one team matrix for all left-handed relievers and a separate one for all right-handed. When making a pitching change, I would choose a left-handed versus right-handed based on the platoon advantage. Keep in mind, these assumptions that I made were only because I was simulating over 600 games at once. In reality, when simulating one game, you can change the starting pitching thresholds as well as choosing which relievers you want at which given time. So here are the results. When I simulated games, I got 10.4% correlation with real scores, as well as when comparing to the betting lines, I saw that there was correctly picked 52% of the time. These results are promising, but I know we can do better, and the prevalence of ball tracking data opens the door for a lot of improvements in the previous method. Weight on base percent, weight on base average, or WOBA, is commonly accepted as one of the best stats for summarizing a hitter's value at the plate. But when looking at first half of the season compared to second half WOBA, first half X WOBA is more predictive of future WOBA than WOBA itself. X WOBA only looks at launch angle and exit velocity in a pitch to predict the batted ball outcome. It attempts to filter out luck and, and defensive impact. Also, we have something called barrel zone. The barrel zone is a range of exit velocity and launch angle, launch angle where hitters have the most success. There are four other barrel zones of varying levels of power. One is the sorry, four other zones of varying levels of power. One is the weakest, four is the hardest, and five is the barrel zone. I use this to create new results. Instead of just a weak single being just called a single, we can now label it as single one, and a harder hit single can be single three. This is great when you have a runner on base, let's say on first base, and we, we know that a single one was hit, less likely to move that runner over extra bases as opposed to single three. This means our Markov chain looks a little bit different. It's a lot bigger, but also a lot more confidence results as there's a lot less nuance as we know how hard the ball was hit. Next, I reran every plate appearance with the machine uh, with the machine learning classifier XG Boost. I break the probability of each plate appearance as opposed to using the real results, and I use the outcomes to create new player distributions. When I reran the grid search, we found that 72% of the results were dictated by the batter and also regressed batting stats by 50 by 50 plate appearances. If you're wondering why the jump in hitter weight, I point to the common belief that pitchers have less control over the ball once it's put in play. Now that we're looking more at the specific type of ball in play, more weight is shifted towards the batter. So here's how the simulation worked out. We saw that correlation jumped by 70% to 17% correlation, also over under accuracy increased to 56%. This is really exciting because there's a lot of uses at all levels of the game. Any program with access to Hawkeye, Yakertech, or TrackMan can utilize this data. So this offseason, division rivals New York Yankees added Juan Soto, and the Baltimore Orioles added Corbin Burns. Prior to Soto, I simulated the Yankees scoring 3.7 runs per game against Burns and the O's. With Soto, that increases the four runs. That comes up to 0.3 runs per game, 49 runs per season, or about five extra wins. Some things going forward that I think can be changed or are better implemented uh, include better, better usage of relievers and when to pull pitchers. Um, I think using a logistic regression approach to predict if a pitcher should be pulled based off of innings pitch or the amount of runs they allowed. 
Also importing weather data and how that affects the run scoring environment. I think button thresholds would be pretty useful. Um, it was hard because initially I added button thresholds based off of the expected uh, run value added. But when you look at the expected times of bunt versus real times, it doesn't really match up. Uh, I looked at Gabby Moreno. I would also consider defenses and ballpark factors. Some teams may be better at turning weak singles into ground outs versus, you know, vice versa. Also, I think you can break down the results into parts. I talked about how pitchers have less, less control over balls in play. So instead of just looking at, you know, every individual result, you can first look at, you know, whether it's a home run, strikeout, walk, or ball in play, maybe more weight towards the pitcher. And then when you're specifically looking at balls in play, maybe more weight towards the batter. So with that, here are my Otani results. And does anyone have any questions? Uh, not to add too much scope creep, but uh, how would your model, uh, or how would you tweak your model to, uh, in the on the reliever side to account for the three batter rule? You just add a minimum. Um, just can't take them out until so they. So you can't just do the lefty righty. You know, arm matchup. You would have to make sure that they stick there for. Well, currently, you know, when I did the um, the simulation of the example, because it's a team. I don't really think it's a factor because I don't, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't switch from right to left or vice versa until they go against three batters. Um, yeah. Okay. Heads up, guys. Oh. Hi, right, thanks for your uh, presentation. I just wanted uh, to understand the 10 and 17% that you mentioned for, that was correlation to real scores from your um, testing data? Yeah, from the 600 games that I took out of the data, I then ran the simulation on those games and that was a correlation from the predicted score to the real score. Okay, okay, so just in general, it wasn't like, it wasn't like 10% of scores were exactly the same. It was the general no, correlation. correlation. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that was the, so that was the R squared? No, or... just, just the correlation. Just the correlation yeah. coefficient. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Reese, uh, great presentation. I was just going to ask, are you concerned at all about potential overfitting? Because you mentioned predicting for all different batted ball outcomes and then even for uh, the type of barrel it is, you know, what have you. But obviously, and you accounted for batter control and pitcher control, but in the future, I'm trying to find the best way to phrase this. Um, sorry. Just uh, like, obviously, you know, I just totally lost it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know. Just great presentation. If I, if I think of it, I'll come see you later, but great job. All right. Yeah. So really good presentation. Um, I just wanted to know if you had, what were your ideas for possible, like, relief pitching uh, kind of circumstances, you know, what players would you bring in uh, and when, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So I tried to, you know, try to take a step back. Um, again, I only looked at, at like a macro level. Um, currently I have it implemented where you could just do the order of relievers you want to use um, based on whether you want to bring in a lefty or a righty. But yeah, in theory, you know, it would have the capability of, you know, a little more nuance to when you want, which guy, but I think there's, possibilities but that's just not something i've done yet yeah <laughs> all right yeah all right. thank you